Good morning, everyone. I'm Joanne Britton, and I'm very happy to welcome you to our February Open Wednesday for the Bucket Class. Before we um, get started and I introduce our speaker, I'd like you to turn on your T-coils, if that applies to you, and please um, silence your cell phones and just put them away so that you won't be distracted. While we listen to our speaker today, we're very happy to welcome Freda Rivera, who is Assistant Professor of Art History at Grinnell College, and he's going to talk to us about the architecture of Grinnell. Right thank you, Joanne, um, and thank you to the Grinnell Bucket Course Committee for inviting me, um, and particularly Judy Hunter. Um, when they asked me to teach the Bucket Course, they, of course, they said I could teach whatever I want, and I teach the Modern Architecture Survey at Grinnell, and I thought it'd be a great idea to sort of look at modern architecture through Grinnell. It's something we do in my classes. One of the first, the first assignments students have is to pick a building in town or on campus and to write about that building. And you'll see that they've somewhat inspired this um, lecture I'm doing today. Um, one of the things um, I want to focus on is comparing examples of architecture here to prominent examples globally. So things we look at within the canon of architectural history. Um, and um, just to start quickly, there is sort of a question of what constitutes modern architecture. Um, and there is sort of many thoughts. It's periodized differently in different fields within art history. Some will sort of begin with the early modern or the Renaissance. Um, and within architecture, that's particularly significant with the writer, with uh, the works of um, artists who, and architects and writers such as Alberti and Palladio, who then begin to influence architects in the 17th to 19th century. Um, but a lot of people begin the survey um, between the 18th and 19th century. And they're particularly thinking of two things. Um, this sort of moment of revolution that happens between France, Haiti, and the United States. So sort of this sort of going towards the birth of the modern nation and sort of the meaning of architecture within that. And then you also have the Enlightenment. So new discourses on science um, and new developments of technology. Um, but most surveys of architecture begin at the moment of industrialization. And I think for the context of Brunel, that's particularly significant because this town is founded in many ways thanks to sort of a lot of the advancements of um, industrialization, and particularly the railroad, as we can sort of see in this image. And I just wanted to show these um, images really quickly, and these, um, this is a great graphic that shows um, the rates of travel within the United States, and how trains really revolutionized both trade and communication within the context of the U.S. So here you could see, just to get from New York to Chicago back in 1800, it would have taken about six weeks. <laughs> By 1830, it's reduced to three weeks, so you have the development of trains, but they're still slow and limited service. And by 1857, you can get there within a matter of days. Um, so trains really revolutionized um, the uh, development, particularly of the West in the United States, of urban sites, um, of sort of the nation of cities like Chicago and like Grinnell, um, which was very purposely founded at sort of a crossroads. So I'm going to begin with uh, the, my first example, um, and I'm going to do this as a series of comparisons. Um, and I want to begin with this comparison, which is the Union Depot in Grinnell, which you can see um, 1893, and we have a 1937 photograph of the building. And then I, uh, below we have St. Pan um, Pancras Station in London. Um, and here we have particularly an image of the train shed, um, which is actually built out of raw iron. Now, one of the important things in the 19th century is the development of different materials for architecture. You have raw iron. Uh, another sort of very big important thing is cast iron. You have cast iron as early as the late 18th century. The, um, there is one example in 1770 of the Iron Bridge in France, which is probably the earliest example of a cast iron structure. Um, for those who aren't familiar, the major difference between raw iron and cast iron is um, um, they're both metal alloys, but in cast iron they're poured into molds, so you get identical um, um, sort of pieces. Um, whereas in raw iron, um, it's sort of hammered out into shape. And so um, by the time St. Pancras is built, um, raw, um, cast iron becomes common. Probably the most prominent example is a building called the Crystal Palace in 1851 in London. Um, and the Crystal Palace um, was uh, the main pavilion for the World um, Exposition in 1851 and was quite gargantuous in size and built within a period of three months. 
Um, so it was quite a significant sort of achievement of its time. Um, here, raw iron becomes particularly useful because you can see that um, the train shed sort of curves to a sort of a low pointed, pointed arc. So that slight curvature, you wouldn't want prefabricated pieces, but um, raw iron, you could sort of bend it and so that it could meet at the point. Um, and but I think it's also significant to think about in this 19th century period of trains developing um, along other new forms of technology, um, photography, for example, and um, as I mentioned, sort of advancements in building materials. Um, now to look at um, St. Pancras, um, the main point I want to make with these two buildings is I think they both represent a sort of crossroads in the context of Grinnell, a crossroads that helps in sort of the founding of this town, its geographic location. And in the context of St. Pancras, um, we have a crossroads of sort of modernity and then the new creation of tradition. And now if you look, let's see if I get this here, um, you have the, sorry, the wrought iron shed with the glass ceiling. This was the largest spanning um, ceiling in the time it was built. Um, so this was quite a technological achievement in its time. But you'll see right here, and I'll show some images of this building, a uh, building that's comprised primarily of red brick and um, stone, and that is done in a more sort of Victorian, neo-Gothic style um, by the architect George Gilbert Scott. So you have the work of an engineer building the, the train shed in the back, and then the front representing the sort of dichotomy. The, ex um, the extremely new, there is a slight Gothic reference with that sort of slight pointed arc, and then a new architectural style that reflects the past of England. So uh, one of the very sort of important things with, um, within debates on architecture in the 19th century is how to deal with these radical changes in new technology. Um, and particularly within the shifting London, what's happening with the working class. I think it's quite significant too. This um, train station is located in the borough of Camden, which is in North London. Um, and it, used, it was built over what was formerly um, a slum, um, the name Agar, Agar Town. Um, so the, um, the idea of sort of um, dislocating people and then creating the sort of new technology as sort of an entryway in the city from the countryside is quite relevant. And I'm sorry I'm going to be going quickly through this. I have too many examples and I want to say, <laughs> I really want to save some time for some Q&A because I have a great feeling that a lot of you have a lot more knowledge about the town than I do as, as a teacher. I've been learning about the town more and more since moving back to Grinnell. But I just wanted to show a few examples. Here we have a really wonderful model of St. Pancras. Um, when the station was built, they decided to build a, sort of a very significant hotel in front of it. And here you can get a sense of the sort of neo-Gothic style um, that was sort of advocated by George Gilbert Scott. Um, it's quite, um, I'd say it has a quite busy facade in parts. There's symmetry, but there's also irregularity. So a lack of symmetry is often something that indicates the Gothic versus the neoclassical. Um, and just rich, really beautiful details that stand in great contrast to the use of um, iron and glass within the train shed. And here we have Grinnell. So, and speaking of Grinnell as a crossroads, um, and particularly with thinking about industrial development, that becomes a very significant within the context of Grinnell. And here you have several buildings. You have the old glove factory, um, which was um, formerly uh, ran by the company Morrison uh, McIntosh and Company. Um, which produced um, gloves from goatskin and other forms of leather. Um, you have the Spalding factory. So here you can see within the sort of turn of the century moment, Grinnell marking itself as a place for sort of the production of industrial goods and that sort of this technological center. And then here we have the quite um, beautiful and quaint train station today, the depot cross, the pepper tree at the depot crossing restaurant. Um, <laughs> And one of my students, and I, I, I'm going to be quoting my students' papers because since they're required to write, I was looking back at their papers while preparing this lecture and figure out how I could create a relationship with the survey. Um, but just a couple of things. This is quite a quaint, and it's not a large station, but I think architecturally it is making a statement, particularly with the tower that marks the corner near the intersection, um, that it's quite voluminous. There is sort of this limestone breaking that I think for a squat two-story tower, it gives it this sort of illusion of greater height. So you, when you're coming into Grinnell, you will see this building. This, um, it's symbolic sort of entering the town. You can think of it that way. It's interesting if anyone's going to the Pepper Tree at the Depot Crossing, and some people are going for Valentine's, um, <laughs> to look at how they um, created the new part of the building. 
and how they try to take in sort of the aesthetic of the house. Um, uh, to quote one of my students, this is James Lamont, he wrote in his paper, at the heart of unions, depots functionality laid the distinct, laid the distinct themes, transit and sustenance. In the bygone era, the building welcomed travelers and then ushered them into town to find either physical or emotional connection. Today, the depot offers similar forms of emotional and physical care through food and gathering space. The architectural story of the depot is ultimately about the ways in which modern architecture can be flexible, incorporating modern additions within historic buildings to realize new functionalities. And it's interesting to think about buildings in multiple ways. There's the process of building. Um, we're going to see in this lecture that I'm going to focus on singular architects, and one thing I always tell my students is architects are never alone in the drafts room. It's a team of people working on the building. Um, the building is a process, whether it's in construction, the way building is appropriated over time. So a lot of the students, when looking at this historic building, became interested in how they existed throughout time, sort of the lives of buildings, you can say. Comparison number two. See, everyone joined me to go quickly through these. Um, here we have um, Goodnow Hall in uh, Grinnell College. This is one of four buildings built after the 1882 tornado that swept through town and destroyed almost the entirety of campus. It is sadly one of the only four... What? Oh, it's one of the only four of the buildings that were built that still exist. The saddens me. Grinnell has a habit of destroying old, architecturally significant buildings. We can talk about that later. <laughs> and, um, and below I have the example by Henry Hobson Richardson, Trinity Church in Boston, um, which is um, probably the most famous example of the Richardsonian Romanesque style of architecture. It's a style of architecture that becomes popular in the United States following the Civil War. Um, when we teach the Modern Architecture Survey, we're often comparing the context of the United States to Europe. In the context of Europe, architects are having a lot of debates on how to conserve and restore old buildings and what style means. In the United States, this is a generalization, but there is sort of a term used to apply to the sort of the turn of the century moment that's called eclecticism. Um, and that is, architects would build whatever the patrons desired. So if you wanted a neo-Gothic building, if you wanted a, a sort of Greek-style temple building, the architect would sort of adapt to that and sometimes create mixtures therein. And, and one of the sort of, and this is a generalization, and when I say Europe, most architectural historians are looking primarily at France and England, but a lot of the thinkers within France and England and the architects attach a certain moral value to the style of architecture. And that didn't exist so much in the US. What's interesting about the, and I will show an example here of Trinity Church in Boston, what's particularly interesting about um, Henry Hobson Richardson's architecture is it becomes immediately influential. It's representing this new moment in US history, um, and there's something very sturdy about these buildings, quite heavy, they're quite grounded. Um, and I think that is very significant when thinking about these buildings. Um, he, some would consider him the first architect in the US. I like to say Louis Sullivan, he's the father of American architecture. We'll look at Louis Sullivan. Um, but um, he uh, was an architect who trained in Paris at the Côte de Beaux Arts. In the 19th century, the Côte de Beaux Arts um, was an academy that became probably the most um, prominent architectural school in its time. And a lot of um, prominent American architects from the late 19th and early 20th century would go to Paris to train at the Côte de Beaux Arts. They had sort of an unconventional educational system where you became first an apprentice, and then after a couple of years you were admitted into the school, you could attend lectures, you had access to the library, and then you sort of entered competitions. And that's sort of how you sort of went through the academy. Um, so he comes back to the United States from the Dakota Bazaar, and he does an architectural style that is, I would say, eclectic. It's not merely Romanesque. Um, and Romanesque is sort of the style that forms after the Roman Empire, so sort of um, early Christianity. Um, and Romanesque is often this, defined by broad archways, large round volumes um, that you could see within the structure. But you can also see, arguably, elements of the Gothic in this building. So you could see a slight mixture, though it feels more Romanesque than Gothic. And I just love to show the sort of sideways back staircase um, that it's the building that you can sort of explore in multiple ways. Um, and so this became sort of a very popular style in its time. It was seen as sort of uniquely American, um, though it was um, copying styles that emanated from um, Western and Southern Europe. And just here's the floor plan. And this floor plan, if I had more time, I would get into sort of how this, how this very, very much mimics the Romanesque style, um, the development of the Roman basilica into the Christian church. And you begin to see that with, it's quite broad and open, but you have sort of the open cross plan 
Um, so within the floor plan, you can read a very direct Romanesque influence. And that takes us to good now. And I, I just love this comparison. Because you can see the similarity. Now, Good Now was our original um, library at Grinnell. Um, it was um, named after Edward A. Goodnow, um, who was a well-known abolitionist and promoted um, a reformer who promoted the public education for, um, for women. And he also donated $10,000 for this building to help build it at Grinnell. It became, um, up until 1905, the library, until eventually Carnegie became the library at Grinnell. Um, and here you can see the original building, it's quite different today, it houses, it houses the Department of Anthropology, but you can see sort of the large original reading room. The staircase, the staircase is still wonderful when you go in today. Um, and you also have the little observatory tower here. So it very much functioned as sort of the significant space for knowledge. And I think it's interesting that of all the new buildings at Grinnell, um, the library was the one that sort of took up the sort of more Romanesque style. We could read many things into that. And here are some um, photographs of the original interior of the building. Quite gorgeous woodwork as well within the building. Um, and I just like this because this also shows um, Chicago Hall. This is where the Bucks Bomb building, the portion of it that was built by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill is. Um, and further behind you have um, Blair Hall. Um, which is a really great neo-Gothic building. That's the one I get most sad that was destroyed. I wish I had that on campus. When I teach Gothic architecture, I take my students to Herrick Chapel. It's a great example of perpendicular Gothic. Um, but here you can sort of get a sense of the original campus. And I'm going to quote another student of mine. Um, this is um, Jeremy Epstein, a uh, current junior at Grinnell. In, in his paper, he started to um, look at debates about restoration and conservation that were popular in the 19th century by two prominent um, thinkers, one's the art critic John Ruskin, and the other's the, um, who's based in England, and the other's the architect of Viollet le Duc, who did a lot of restorations in France, probably most famously to Notre Dame in Paris. Ruskin did not like Viollet le Duc because Viollet le Duc would put iron elements within his reconstructions. Um, and there are certain examples of cathedrals where he would put a cast iron ceiling on them. And Ruskin felt that you had to conserve buildings, that the, the aura of the building was dependent on this, the, the work of the labor. Their touching of the stone, the sort of decay of the building, there was a beauty to that to Ruskin. And that was lost in these renovations that created some, I like to say, tell my students, some, when you look at some of the things Viola the Duke touched, they still more Disney-esque. They feel like brand new to their old buildings through the use of the Right, I, I can tell you that if you had been teaching art history at that time, you would have taught in the attic of Chicago Hall. Yes. Really? <laughs> Did we have our history at that time? <laughs> oh, nice. Was Dick Servine there? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Edith Sternfield taught that course. Uh, she touched about every, every slide. <laughs> I miss the old slides too, because they used to make a humming noise, they put you to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> now I have to really entertain the students. Um, so, um, and this is what Jeremy Epstein writes. While the building's renovation compromised its essential feature, it also permitted it to continue serving its noble purpose, albeit less elegantly than before. And perhaps it will continue to do so for a long time to come. In concluding some comments on the building, former Grinnell professor Walter Walker writes, quote, there is a good chance that the college will celebrate its bicentennial and its tricentennial with good now at the center of the celebrations, end quote. Given though, what we are on the brink of yet another massive modernist building project, perhaps Professor Walker's optimism that good now will continue to hold red relevance ought to be taken with a grain of salt. While the college may still recognize value in historic Gunnow Hall, it seems safe to say it recognizes far greater value in the modernist aesthetic, which has been creeping across campus. <laughs> but then, this is how it has always been. At Grinnell, new architecture is always on the vanguard. Remember, the post-cyclone building spree, which yielded good now. Critics on new, of the new style needn't despair. At an institution this progressive, it's never long before the aesthetic changes. So he's sort of getting into sort of what's the value of the history. I do think that's a current within Grinnell. One of the reasons it's great to teach modern architecture here is that we do have a lot of great modern architecture buildings because there is this investment both in the town and the college of, of the new. We could debate the value of Cesar Pebble later. <laughs> to move on, oh, here's another great black and white photograph. 
And now to move on to our third comparison, and probably what's seen as sort of uh, an icon of Grinnell, definitely is the sort of city plan, and we've sort of embraced um, Louis Sullivan's Merchants Bank um, as the sort of symbol of the town, uh, particularly sort of the front portico here, you have this almost keyhole-like entrance with this sort of beautiful sort of diamond-shaped design with the round rose window here, um, sort of the entrance into sort of the safety box. Um, we had um, last year a convocation by Blair Kameen, who is the um, architectural critic for the Chicago Tribune, and the very first piece of architectural criticism he wrote, his first job as the Des Moines Register, was on this bank in Grinnell. Um, and he made sort of this very fascinating point, he called it like the jewel of Iowa. And this is back in the early 1980s, um, um, mid-1980s, early 1990s, I'm sorry, when he wrote this. Um, and it was really exciting to sort of talk to him about this, um, this building, um, which um, was one of um, 12 major jewel box banks that Louis Sullivan did towards the end of his career. Um, Louis Sullivan was not easy to work with and did not have a lot of commissions towards the end of his career. So he ended up traveling around the Midwest and particularly building um, banks that became particularly relevant for farmers um, when they would come in um, to do their loans for the harvest season. And I like to say he created a religious experience. I imagine a lot of you have walked into this building and it's, it's quite spectacular inside. Um, and I want to compare it to probably what is one of the most famous um, Louis Sullivan buildings and it's um, when he was one of the chief architects for the firm Adler and Sullivan and this is the Wainwright building in St. Louis, Missouri. It's considered one of the very first skyscrapers in the United States. Um, it's a 12-story building with a um, steel frame. And it's a, an important precedent for thinking about what Louis Sullivan is doing later in his career with these sort of smaller banks. Um, and um, one of the things I have to say is this very much encapsulates Louis Sullivan's ideals about modern architecture at the sort of turn of the 20th century moment. He has this um, famous essay he wrote um, called Tall Office Building Reconsidered. And he sort of has a critique of architecture that's happening elsewhere. He has a stereotype of the East, particularly places like New York and Boston, as being more conservative in their approach to architecture. They're trying to recreate the Gothic or the classical style within the skyscraper form. And he sort of makes an argument that the material should speak to the form of the building. His famous quotation is, um, form follows function. Um, and so he sort of says, this, given sort of the new technologies, the skyscraper should have four major parts. One is, I like to say, the underbelly or the basement. And the basement will be where the utilities are. You have to you know, keep a certain level of humidity within the building. So you have sort of the machinery underneath. Then you have what is sort of the more public and civic space of the office building, the first two floors. So you have the lobby entrance, and this is where sort of all the public amenities would be within the building. Then you have, oh, sorry. Um, and then you have what are the office spaces within the building, which are identical until you reach every, a lot, almost every skyscraper of his has what I like to call like a topping. Like you need something to sort of signify the end of the skyscraper. And what I think is really relevant in sort of his new architecture style is there's an emphasis in one sense on verticality and you get that through these pilasters that reach from just above sort of this more public civic space all the way up to the top towards this beautiful terracotta cornice. Um, you also, so you get the sort of sense of verticality. You also have with the creation of um, sort of a steel armature, what is called a curtain wall. So unlike good now, where the stones were very important, they were load-bearing, here the walls are not load-bearing. The walls are sort of floating, and what's, what's really bearing the weight is sort of the steel armature. Um, so they have a more sort of decorative function. Um, so he really creates a sort of new aesthetic that then becomes very influential. And this is how he becomes known as sort of the, the um, father of American architecture. And I just love to show the cornice. Um, in this case, terracotta, it's very similar to the ceramic elements we see within the Merchants Bank here in Grinnell, and it's something he was very known for. I also think this associates him with a lot of his contemporaries working within Europe. In Europe at this moment, there's a well-known movement called Art Nouveau, um, and it develops somewhat from the arts and craft movement. You have someone like William Morris, who's very much playing with sort of vegetal and plant life, and then a lot of Art Nouveau architects, Hector Guimard, um, um, who famously did the Paris Metro, that are also working with these sort of floral motifs in a decorative manner. And here you can see these sort of beautiful details that lie in the cornice of the building. And here we have our gorgeous building in Grinnell. Um, there's so much you can say about this, and perhaps I should just go um, straight to sort of quoting one of my students. Um, this is Muriel O'Brien, who wrote a really beautiful paper. She got obsessed with rectangles within the building. 
Um, and she very much identified this as sort of like a safety box, a jewel box. Um, so there's sort of this building that through, the, the, through um, the form of the rectangle in sort of varying scales, um, you get a sense of sort of this box that both opens up or protects. Um, and she um, writes commenting on sort of the importance of its patrons within Grinnell, um, and she sort of identifies the patrons as the Grinnell community. She writes, quote, the fervor surrounding the bank additionally contributed to a discourse that set the bank as a safe keep. In anticip an anticipation of the bank's opening, the Grinnell Herald writes, quote, the architecture of the Merchants Bank building is to represent strength, security, and wealth, end quote. The choice of the word represent underlines the distinction between form and function. In addition, the specifications of strength, security, and wealth anticipates this future form to be, the, to be in the traditional bank format. Later in the article, the Herald writes that the bank will be devoted entirely to bank purposes and thereby confirms that the bank will indeed serve its traditional function and alignment this traditional form. Ultimately, the association between form and function in this early article demonstrates the town's desire for an institution to promote economic growth and security. I also think it's interesting to think of this building um, in comparison to the first two examples we started with, which represented broader trends in the United States. Good, um, the bank, and what we're going to look at next, Ricker House, really represents sort of the creation of an architectural style that's identified with the region, that's identified with the Midwest. And here is the interior. And so comparison number four. Um, and so to the above, we have Walter Burley and Mary Mahoney Griffin, the Ricker House in Grinnell, Iowa. I believe it's still for sale. I still cannot afford it. <laughs> I'm trying to get a group of alum to buy it and then put the architectural historian to take care of the building, but I don't know if that's going to work. Um, and so we have above the um, Walter Burley and Mary Mahoney Griffin um, Ricker House, and below we have um, the Capitol Theater. Um, I think I'll go straight into the Ricker House. Um, this is particularly interesting, the Ricker House. Uh, Marion, um, both Walter Burley and Marion Holy Griffin um, were in Grinnell at this moment and ended up leaving Grinnell. And I'll show their urban plan that they had for the Rock Hill community within Grinnell um, a little bit later. Maybe I'll get to that and then we'll have our break. Um, and, and they were known for building uh, particularly a lot of domestic homes. There was a period between 1910 and 1912 where sort of Frank Lloyd Wright um, runs off with his mistress and Marion Mahoney, kind of ends up doing a lot of his design. So a lot of buildings that are attributed to Frank Lloyd Wright for about a two-year period. Um, we actually have a student, Rebecca Rennick, who did extensive research. Marion Mahoney Griffin was, I believe, the second female graduate from MIT School of Architecture and was quite exceptional. And she often didn't take credit for a lot of the work she did. And so it's believed that, and Walter Burley Griffin historically has gotten a lot of the credit for this, but it's believed that she's worked on a lot of the floor plans. Traditionally, we've given her credit for the decorative elements. She worked beautifully with glass and ceramic. So she would work on creating these beautiful decorative elements, lamps throughout the home. Um, you can look at some early Frank Lloyd Wright and see a lot of windows. And if she was collaborating with Frank Lloyd Wright, her, touch, her hands were likely on it. Um, so I think she is particularly a very relevant and important architect in American history. And the Art Institute of Chicago actually has a sort of like endless thousand page biography, autobiography she wrote, which is quite fascinating. And our student based her research on sort of that archive. Um, so um, they are in Grinnell in this moment. This is sort of the one house they design. I'll also show the fountain um, Walter Burley Griffin designed for Central Park nearby. Um, and I think this house, uh, I'll talk about it as Instead of giving historical details, because I imagine some people will have historical details, I want to talk about how it really encapsulates this sort of prairie style that we see in particularly examples like Frank Lloyd Wright. Probably the most famous example of sort of the early prairie style by Frank Lloyd Wright um, is the Roby House in Chicago, which has done a few years before this. But well, um, some of the elements that help define, and here we could look at sort of a floor plan. I'm sorry, the quality of this image isn't the best. This is really great, this image. This is actually owned by the college and we bought it from a art dealer in Australia. So they moved to Australia because Walter Burley Griffin wins this huge commission to design the capital of Canberra. And with it, they obviously are taking documents so that when they're showing potential patrons what architectural services they can provide, they would have this. So this is when the college received it, it was rolled up. But it's, um, and it's, it's a bit faded now, but you have 
the floor plans of Ricker House, this gorgeous um, elevation, um, or sort of um, front image of, of Ricker House, and then a, a section of it. So one of the things Mary Mahoney Griffin was known for was doing really beautiful renderings. And so she's and in this sort of document, which is about yay big, um, they're sort of using that to show potential patrons, you know, this is the work we've done elsewhere in the United States. And so they traveled with, from Grinnell to Australia with that, and now it's back in Grinnell. Um, and here you can sort of see, you have the first floor and the second floor. If you look here, you have the fireplace here. Um, there's several things that identify um, the sort of prairie style, uh, or the Frank Lloyd, uh, particularly um, as associated with the Frank Lloyd Wright. One is the notion of the hearth or a center of the home, and the form of the home forming around that hearth, which you see somewhat here with the staircase on this side and the fireplace on this side. This is the clear center from the home from which everything emanates. Another is a sense of horizontality and groundedness. Um, if you ever get, I imagine some of you have been to Mason City, if you ever get a chance to go to Mason City, it probably has, I went with my class last semester and I was kind of astounded by the amount of prairie style architecture they have. Yes. And they have the only running um, frankly, Wright Hotel there. Uh, we got a tour from a wonderful alum who was basically led the project for renovating um, that hotel. Um, but within the Rockland neighborhood of Mason City, you have the, the highest concentration of prairie style architecture. So you have the sort of the formation around a hearth, sort of this notion of horizontality, and then you have decorative elements throughout that connect the building. And this sort of is, um, I'm very interested in the way that the prairie style relates to other <coughs> movements that are happening concurrently. So you have, you mentioned Art Nouveau, and there's definitely a relationship with Art Nouveau. In Art Nouveau, there's this notion of sort of the total work of art, so that the architect would work on furnishing, would work on every single element. So it wasn't like buying a prefabricated home and then going to Ikea and getting the furniture. <laughs> and Frank Lloyd Wright was particularly anal retentive about this. If, you, if Frank Lloyd Wright came into one of his homes that he designed for you and saw that you put your own furniture in, he would get really mad. And he'd go, beautiful but really uncomfortable wooden furniture. <laughs> 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 Here you can see, again, um, one of the interesting things is that my student who worked on this, um, she, um, she particularly got interested in sort of the recent history of the building. Um, one of the things when, they, when the house was sold, after it was sold to Grinnell College, they took down one of the sort of plaster walls and ended up finding some beautiful colored ceramic work that they believe was done by Mary Mahoney Griffin within the home. Um, so sometimes owners will buy homes and take away the most beautiful historic elements of it. And um, I just love to show this example. Now this facade of this theater, this is the Capitol Theater in Melbourne, it's obviously conforming to its local urban context. So it appears like quite a sort of a regular facade, but you can see these elements that might suggest it's um, a little more prairie style, and that particularly shows up in these windows here, these sort of details, you'll see these in a lot of prairie style homes. Um, there is also sort of these sort of broken, this broken cornice, these engaged pilasters going all the way up. They're not like mimicking the classical style. They're playing with it, but creating it anew. This is also happening during the era of Art Deco. Um, and Art Deco is a term that isn't invented into the 1960s, but it defines a trend towards geometric abstraction. Um, and the Perry style hasn't traditionally been associated with Art Deco, but there's a lot of interesting parallels, and they're happening at the same time. And I, but probably what's most fantastic about this building um, is the um, theater within, where you have this sort of exaggerated use of line that also emphasizes the horizontal. You have these sort of decorative elements um, out of, um, cast out of plaster. These very much recall sort of a notion of the arabesque, um, which is a term to refer to the sort of intricate details that show up in sort of um, Arab Arabic architecture, particularly in southern Spain, but interpreted in sort of a new context. And I associate this with Art Deco a bit because it's excessively modern, but it is also sort of referring to other cultures. And here you get some of the details. Another interesting thing to do is to look at Frank Lloyd Wright's work in the same period um, in California, or a little bit later in California. He begins to experiment with concrete and makes these unique concrete blocks that have designs that are somewhat akin to sort of these very intricate designs you see here, playing with sort of geometric forms in this really sort of intricate and rich manner. And we will break after this one, but I just love showing this. Um, this is their plan for the Grinnell um, hillside subdivision. 
Um, that was done between 1911 and 12. This obviously was never built, but we could have been like the Mason City of Iowa, I like to imagine, if this was built. Um, and here, um, and this sort of exists sort of where Manor Circle, over by where the golf course is, this, I believe this is where this was sort of intended for. Um, and this shows one of the many examples of urban plans that were never built. Um, and then below you have the reason they left Grinnell, which was to help design this capital here. Here we have the uh, um, capital um, of Australia, Canberra, um, done in this sort of very radial plan, of defined by concentric circles. Um, the um, expansion of a um, of the lake into sort of these basins, um, and particularly what you see in this um, map is it's very much connected to um, what's called um, the city beautiful, which is oh, sorry an idea that's developed by the architect and landscape designer Frederick Law Olmsted at the turn of the century in the U.S. And he's responsible for building uh, a lot of great first ring suburbs, particularly in the eastern part of the United States. Um, and his influence is most seen in sort of Central Park. And it's this idea to incorporate greenways and parkways into sort of urban design. Um, and you see that very much here with these sort of a variety of greenways. You also have sort of a sense of strict zoning here. So here you have the market center, the civic center, the residential suburb, the capital following with sort of all of the government buildings therein. So it's this very sort of planned modernist city. Um, and just to look a little bit more closely at the example of, of Grinnell, it's interesting to look at this within a sort of the creation of a modern capital versus the creation of a community within a small town that has a very distinct urban core. I think that's one of the things that makes teaching architecture interesting at Grinnell. We are a small town, but there is something urban and pedestrian about our core, our center. Um, and here you have something that's a more of a suburban layout. You can get with these lines a sense of sort of the undulating topography and sort of the, how the way the streets are sort of corresponding to that. Here you have a roundabout that's sort of connecting throughout. So it's suburban but not cookie cutter, that's what I like to say. Yeah. <laughs> and just to show sort of another significant design, I believe it's at the bottom of a lake somewhere in Grinnell, I've been told. I don't know if this is true. Um, but here you have the uh, memorial, the Clark Memorial Fountain in Grinnell. There is a great model of it inside the Merchants Bank in downtown Grinnell that you can sort of check out. Um, but this just shows a lot of the sort of play with design and geometric form. You almost have this sort of suggestion of a cross form within this design. And here it is as it was in town. And I, uh, we, we need a break in three minutes, but before I sort of go on to what will become the modern era, well, maybe I'll save Q&A, we'll, I'll go to the modern era a bit quickly, but I, I also want to show these. These are really, really, really great images by Mary Mahoney Griffin. Um, these, these are watercolors she would do. So she is imagining, within Canberra, you have um, a topography where you could be up on a hill overlooking the city. So she is, um, as her husband is creating the urban plan, she is creating these sort of beautiful perspectives where you could look at the city from afar. Now, after they go to, um, after they live in Australia for um, well over a decade, um, Walter Burley Griffin ends up getting huge commissions in Lucknow in India. And they end up going to India. There's very few of their designs that were completed. Walter Burley Griffin dies shortly thereafter, and Mary Mahoney moves back to the Midwest and resides in Chicago for the rest of her life. Um, but she, in this time period between, I think, Australia and India, very much um, refines her ability as a, a, a renderer and an artist, and really does beautiful work, particularly experimenting. Um, in the Indian ones, you almost see this sort of like rich gold color that sort of aligns her sort of various renderings. So here you get a sense, it's um, like she's doing an elevation of the entire city as it would be seen with sort of these prominent buildings that would be sort of atop. And I will leave us for a 10 minute break and then we'll go into the modern era world. Thank you everyone for taking your seats. I'm sure we're all very anxious to hear what else Fredo has in store for us. So let's give our attention back to Fredo. Thank you. 
I'm conveniently getting through this quickly because I do want to spend maybe 15, 20 minutes on Q&A, so I only have two more comparisons. Um, one that'll take us into the mid-20th century and one that'll take us to the contemporary. Um, so we are doing a whole survey of architecture today. <laughs> Um, and so we have comparison number six here, um, and here we have two buildings by um, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, that I'll just refer to as SOM, as they're popularly known. SOM is um, probably one of the most important architectural firms that develops in the mid-20th century, um, particularly with sort of this sort of notion of sort of a high modern architecture. Um, in the United States, um, you have the promotion um, in between World War I and II of what's called the international style. There's a famous exhibition in MoMA in the 1940s, um, that's done by creator Alfred Hitchcock, um, that begins to create a survey of what's happening in modern architecture in Europe and then in the United States. Um, and he very much promotes the sort of idea of an architecture that embraces new material, that there's just sort of this move away from what we saw in the 19th century, which was sort of a replication of styles of the past. And you get the styles that, here you get to see um, facades with glass surfaces, um, with the emphasis of steel, sometimes you have white walls. Um, so you begin to see the sort of new style of architecture. And by the post-World War II period, um, it develops as sort of a much more grandiose scale. Um, and here we have two buildings that are associated with one of the lead architects of um, SOM, Walter Netsch, who um, designed, um, helped design three buildings at Grinnell. One's no longer here at the Peck, we're not that sad about that. I hate to say that. Usually I'm mad when buildings are destroyed at the Peck, I was okay with. Uh, you have the Berlin Library, and then what is one of my favorite buildings at Grinnell, um, the Forum, um, which was built um, by where the old Union was, which was a wooden building, um, and very, very much became the sort of symbol of modernism within the campus of Grinnell College. And then below we have what is probably one of the most iconic SOM buildings, um, and this is the U.S. Air Force Academy. It was built in a period of over a decade. Um, and it is quite massive in scale. Um, it's, to give you a clue, it's at a very high elevation within Colorado. It's, um, it says Colorado Springs, it's just outside of Colorado Springs. Um, it's a 3,000 acre academy, so much larger than for now. Um, it contains housing for 8,000 people, a hospital, a supply center, and um, an academic complex. And probably the most um, spectacular building is the Cadet Chapel, which you can see, oh, what's happened to my name? Which you can see sort of right here. Um, so this very much becomes sort of an icon of sort of the style that SOM is promoting. It's sort of what I like, um, what some scholars would call sort of a techno-utopia. Um, all campuses are, I like to say, a form of utopia. Um, a sort of experiment of a unique society, residential liberal arts college is very much emblematic of that. And here you have the creation of sort of a military academy. That's really representing um, the use of, um, with, of new technologies and materials in this very exaggerated way. Um, I like to say you have these sort of tetrahedral structures within the cathedral, within the chapel, the cadet chapel, and we'll look at those more closely, that almost feel like they're soaring up. That almost recall, and this is the Air Academy, that sort of recall this idea of flight in a building. Um, and I have just a couple models here to give you sort of a greater clue of the campus, and then perhaps we could think about how some of the academic buildings relate to sort of a smaller scale campus center like the Forum. But you can see everything is sort of based on sort of an orthogonal grid within the sort of mountainous landscape. Um, and you have these sort of courtyards within the building. The one building that kind of breaks sort of the the quadrangle or the sort of grid-based design of this building is the really um, fantastic Cadet Chapel that you see here within the model. So this is a model from 1955, so this is early in its construction. The buildings were done, obviously, in sort of over different periods of time. And I just really love this model because it gives you a better clue um, both of um, what you have is this sort of what functions as sort of a campus center here and then the really fantastic chapel. Now, one of the challenges with this chapel is it had to serve three distinct religious groups. It had a Protestant meeting space, a Catholic meeting space, and a Jewish meeting space. Because uh, it was um, getting students from all of these faiths and then more. Um, so, one of the influences of the design was not to make any specific religious references in the design. Rather, it's very much celebrating um, this idea of new technology, of soaring through space. There's a certain sense of height you get with this building that is then sort of emphasized within the interior of the building. 
Um, and here you could see what I was talking about with these sort of like tet um, tetrahedral structures that are broken up by these panes of glass that bring light in quite beautifully, that create the sort of sense of soaring, the sense of air coming in. This is the sort of um, main meeting space for the Protestants, which was the largest meeting space within um, the chapel. And I should have brought a floor plan of the chapel now that I think about it. But I also wanted to show one of the, the academic complexes. Um, it's just interesting looking at this. Um, it almost looks like a cybernetic grid, though it's not yet in that time. You can see sort of how new technologies are even beginning to influence floor plans um, within designs. Um, and this becomes particularly something prevalent with SOM with some of their future commissions in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and here, um, this sort of highlights the various sort of functions within the building. And that takes us to Grinnell College. Um, and I got this photograph from Art Store and I kind of was like, oh, this is from my time. I think that's Graham Miller and Dave Rader. <laughs> it's weird going to Art Store and seeing your friends in there. I don't know who uploaded this photo to Art Store. Um, but here we have uh, the example of the Forum, which is very much built as a campus center. Um, one of the really amazing things about this building is its emphasis on the material, and there's a certain rawness to the material. Um, you have a movement that forms, um, it begins in the 1950s and it becomes most prevalent in the 70s called Brutalism. It's, um, the name Brutalism comes from two British architects, Allison and um, um, Allison and Peter Smithson, um, they write a famous essay called The New Brutalism, and they're very much experimenting with public housing in the context of London, um, and sort of really embracing materials in a different way. Um, and by the 1970s, the definition of brutalism transforms, but a lot of people associate it with those sort of big concrete buildings you see, where the concrete is left untreated. So the concrete is poured into a wooden armature, and then when the wooden armature is removed, instead of painting over or putting a layer of stucco over, you see the grain of the wood within the concrete. And the Forum is a great example of this. It's very much celebrating the fact that the building is built out of concrete. Um, you also have these sort of dark um, glass panes and then just beautiful woodwork within. Um, I think Walter Nesh was very sort of careful about thinking about how these materials related to each other um, for being what are sort of the basic elements of construction. Also, just another side note, the old ritual lounge chairs, which are mysteriously missing, like a lot of conspiracy theories of where they went. <laughs> They're quite valuable, those chairs, actually. They're by a designer, um, Harry, Berto Harry Bertola. Um, and then what was the most prominent about the forum is you used to have the grill in the center and then the two lounges. And the lounges very much formed these sort of meeting spaces within campus, um, much like the Joe Rosenfield Center does today. Um, and there was a certain warmness and coziness, like you were in this almost like this glass room. Um, you also had this sort of beautiful ceiling and light fixtures, which I think I might have a, a better photograph of that, um, which gives you sort of a sense of, there's almost like a ziggurat temple effect with the way the sort of ceiling bevels upwards. Um, and even the pattern of the woodwork, the direction it's moving in, it, the building using very simple materials creates a lot of visual interest while also creating a space that's quite warm inside. Now, to return to this floor plan, and this floor plan is from um, a study done on the building that was um, about ADA accessibility in 2011. If anyone's been in this building, you'll know that this building is not very ADA accessible. I like to say it's quite labyrinthine, and one of the intentions of the architects in creating this home, I, to me it's like a ziggurat like temple. You walk in, you go downstairs, you go upstairs, you find these broad meeting spaces, but then you turn a corner and you're in a little nook, or you're in a classroom that's overlooking the space. So it's very much meant to be the space to navigate and explore, um, which is a really neat idea for a campus center. Um, our campus center now doesn't function in that same sort of exploratory manner, um, but you can find your own nooks and crannies within the space. Um, and here you can get sort of a sense, we have the lower level plan, we have offices in the upper level, we don't have what's sort of in between, but the building exists at sort of multiple levels. And that's one of the challenges we currently have with this building. I think it's extremely architecturally valuable, but it doesn't fit ADA standards. It's a big concern of the college. So that creates a concern with the future of this building. There's even some bathrooms you go in and as you open the bathroom door, you have to go down three steps. <laughs> you can't get away from it. 
And I wanted to put another student on this, um, who wrote about this building. And he was talking about Netsch's use of, of field theory, um, which is very much thinking about this relationship of like informatics and geometry. Um, and this is a student of mine, Ethan Evans, he wrote, the, form, the form's exterior molds into the shape of its lattice. Concrete piers on each of its four corners open into 90 degree angles, implying a square that stretches into the land around the building. The window walls adjacent to each lounge open outwards, forming diagonal sheets of glass. Diagonals are found throughout the exterior. The stairs at the center of the structure, concrete piers as they plunge into the structure, and slope of the land going from the west to the east end of the building all maintain the slant. Diagonals mediate the harsh horizontal and vertical forms elsewhere on the exterior, and mirror the diagonal walls that close into stairs inside the forum. While subtle, the repetition of lattice-inspired geometric features enhance the flow of the building's interior into its ex exterior space. So here Ethan's suggesting um, a couple of things. One is that while the space is variegated, there's sort of um, a pattern connection throughout that really connects and creates a sense of harmony within this building. I think another thing that's quite significant and something important to consider throughout all the examples I've shown is the siding is quite significant where this building is placed on campus and how this building relates to the landscape around it. That, this, you can see this is imposing, it's a concrete and glass structure, but there's something very subtle about the way this building relates to the landscape around it. So it's using strict geometric patterns. Um, and to me, it also relates it to the prairie style a bit, though it's a, you know, this very modern building. It's a building that's low hung and sort of rooted to the ground. So Walter Nesch, while he was trying to employ these very sort of new vanguardist ideas, was still referring to the architecture of the region. Oh, that should be comparison number seven. Sorry about that. Um, and this is our last comparison before we break into Q and A. Um, and this is Cesar Pelli. Cesar Pelli has also done three buildings on campus, like SOM. Um, most recently, um, the yeah, big gym. Was that before or after the JRC? That's fading my memory now. I want to say the bear. After. Phase one opened before the JRC, though. And phase two opened after. That's why it was confusing me. So you have a concurrent, uh, in one time period, um, uh, you have both the Joe Rosenfield Center and you have um, the creation of um, the new gym in Grinnell, which replaced the old PEC. And then you also have the Buxbaum Center for the Arts, which is around 1997, um, are sort of the major commissions that Cesar Pelli gets within Grinnell. Um, now, Cesar Pelli, as an architect, um, I like to say he is one of the ultimate corporate architects. Um, he is very well known in the field. Um, and so Grinnell was obviously for its latest and newest buildings trying to get new commissions. In the case of the Buxbaum Center for the Arts, um, that building, a core of that building is originally an SOM building, and then Cesar Kelly built around that sort of core and to sort of enhance and build from there. So I'm in, the, in my building, I'm in the old SOM core. I'm, I'm very proud to be in that sort of part of the building. <laughs> like this is a Walter Nesh building, not a Cesar Kelly building. <laughs> um, and one of the things um, that I think is sort of significant about uh, the hiring of Cesar Kelly, it kind of re reflects the sort of trend in contemporary architecture to move to the star architect, which is historically, you could relate that to, to some extent to Louis Sullivan coming to Grinnell um, and to um, Walter Nesh coming to Grinnell. Um, and there is also sort of this interesting, very contemporary play with style and geometry. And I think that's what really relates these two buildings that look extremely different from each other. Um, so below we have um, probably what is one of his most famous commissions, which is the Patronus Towers of Kuala Lumpur, which for a few years was the tallest building in the world. Um, it's a set of twin towers in the capital of uh, commercial towers in the capital of Kuala Lumpur with this very sort of convenient and neat sort of connecting walkway. And I just wanted to show uh, a floor plan. Uh, this is a sample of one of the floors in the building. And then this is sort of a model of the building. And what you get is within one building, given sort of the rich diversity of a country like Malaysia, um, Cesar Pelli is an architect of uh, um, of Argentine origin, his office is based in New York, but he's coming into this foreign context and trying to pay homage, design-wise, to the culture with which he's working. So within this design, uh, you can see the influence of Buddhist designs, Buddhist temples, mandalas. Um, you can see the influence of Islamic design, particularly with the play of geometric form. I mentioned the Arabesque earlier. Um, 
and also sort of the influence of U.S. skyscraper style architecture, really global style, I shouldn't say U.S. Um, and really playing with that to create a building that's playing with new technologies but referring to the past in sort of a creative, inventive way through geometric form. And I think that very much relates to his buildings in Grinnell where he's sort of playing with geometric form and materials in a really interesting way. Which takes us nicely um, to our campus center here. Um, and here you can see what I mean with the playing of form and with materials that refer to the local place. This building sometimes confuses me because there's a lot of nautical references and I don't know where they belong in Grinnell. We started with trains and we somehow ended up with undulating windows and portholes and I'm like, where's the river? Or are we swimming in, in Arbor Lake? I don't know what's happening. Why is there a well room here? So it confuses me a little bit. But there are many local references within. Um, for one, you have the extensive use of red brick, of Iowa limestone. So material that both refers to our place, where we are locally, um, but also material that refers to the history of the campus, to the use of red brick. And I think Buxbaum is a great example of that. He really plays with brick in an inventive way in um, the Buxbaum Center for the Arts. Here's what I mean about the, that undulating window, which has always confused me. Why would you have in this wintry place this like, tall, <laughs> cascading, undulating um, sort of like, glass facade? Um, but there is something very sort of, there's something from building what was formerly the tallest building in the world to building a building like this, there's something very sort of flashy and engaging about his work. Um, one of the things I recommend is, if you're ever going into the Joe Rosenfield Center, um, is to look at the vents. The vents in that building are done with this sort of detailed woodwork that's quite beautiful. Some of them are falling apart a little bit, and I imagine they're hell of expensive because they're not these sort of prefabricated vents, they're specially designed ones. But one of the things he works as, as an architect, is taking material and playing with it in a sort of very rich way. And, and in Buxbaum you see that with his playing of cork board, or the floor of the Faulkner Gallery in which they're taking plywood and cutting it against the grain, which is a very expensive and arduous process to then create the floor. So he's playing with material in unconventional ways to create not just um, engaging geometries that help define how you sort of navigate through the space, but um, material surfaces that are just visually fascinating and interesting. And I'm gonna, I wanna break into Q&A, but I wanna read one last quotation from a student of mine before I do that. Um, and this is by um, Lori Benedict, and she was writing actually in the Buckbaum Center for the Arts. I've had no student lines write about this building yet. Um, and she wrote, the architect's combination of modern and classical materials and styles, often in direct juxtaposition, lends itself to a dynamic and rhythmic design. Cesar Pelli utilizes drastic sharp corners, contrasted with sweeping cur curvilinear lines, layered in interconnected sections of the building read like a cubist painting. In exaggerating effects of recession into space, it emphasizes the importance of perspective in the perception of a building. And I used to have a bias against Cesar Pelli, and then when I read this paper, I was like, oh, okay, I get it. See, this is the great thing about teaching you learn from your students, and sometimes, as an architectural historian, I just have bi like biases, and, I, and it's nice to see buildings through fresh eyes. And she was really, navigate, she was really navigating the building and trying to understand you know, what was his intentions and how you navigate the space. Um, and I think she captured it very beautifully in this paper. Um, and I will, I just now open it up to Q&A. <laughs> I have a question about, you said that the idea, the concept of room is taken from the Buxbaum Center. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you use in your work? I guess the change I'm referring to is, um, oh, so this is a question asking about sort of what was that change in brutalist architecture that happened over time. And I'd say it's more of a change of what the original theory was from the 1950s to how we understand it today. Now we see concrete structures and they're automatically brutalist. Um, but I think the way the original architects were conceiving it was it twofold. One was sort of the social utility of architecture they were thinking about, and then sort of how materials related to that. And that's gotten lost in translation over time. So now we just identify big um, civic concrete buildings in the 1970s as brutalist. But the Skywalk, that's good. <laughs> it's the old thing. <laughs> so I thinking about Pelley and the college buildings. For example, Buxbaum, it seems to me he's deliberately making a statement that by the surfaces, 
stone or whatever on the outside. There's a different function in here. The art studios are different from the music area, from the black box. And you're supposed to be able to read the building from the outside, I, I think, is what it's trying to do. But it isn't common to put as many different materials into a single building as he does. And, and does to, to a degree in, in, in Rosenfield. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really interesting, and I think it's a little bit more successful in, oh, so this is a question about materials um, in Cesar Pelli's buildings, particularly in Buxbaum, because I, um, one of the things George mentioned is that often um, the materials relate to the sort of the function within, so from the outside you could see this, this differentiation of spaces. Um, and I think that's very true, it's a bit, feels more deliberate in the context of Buxbaum than it does in the JRC. Um, you do have spaces within the JRC where the material identifies, and, and we're looking at one right there with the well room. But this is a separate space within the dining hall. You also have the, the fireplace space within the, which has this like, it almost looks like a black volcanic rock yeah, that's yes. sort of within. Um, that is very much differentiating itself from the rest of the building. He is playing with that and throughout the JRC, but it's not as clearly distinct as Buxbaum. And I think it's interesting too to think about what the building from the exterior is trying to impress upon the viewer and what's in the interior. It's kind of the opposite of what we saw with the St. Pancras train station, where like the shed did not match what was in front of it. Here, the idea is the exterior should match the interior, but at the same time, there's a critique of Buxbaum that's quite interesting, is that it kind of closes itself off to the town. That you have this sort of sunken um, entrance when you're coming into campus, and it like, naturally leads you to it, but it's almost as if it's turning its back. Um, formally speaking to the town, um, even though it was sort of meant to be sort of that extension into town. Do you think he wanted to cancel SOM? I mean, I, he obviously is surrounding the SOM building, so you don't see a whole lot of it left, uh, from first, particularly from the campus angle, or is he being, think he's, or is he being sensitive to the SOM? So this is a question if he's being sensitive or sort of canceling out the SOM building. I'm going to give the architect the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> and actually, you know, when you, when you first approach the building, it's hard to tell that they're two different buildings. And the SOM building, um, there's that use of the gray brick where all the sort of classrooms and offices are, and then there's the use of the darker brick where the Roberts Theater is. And so I already think SOM is playing with these different bricks, and then he's taking it to the next level. So to me, it complements it in an interesting way. Um, it does take emphasis away in that he's creating a new central space and lobby with the rotunda. Um, and then the studio is further removed from that. So there is this variation of space, but I think it works actually quite nicely um, with the SOM um, space. I, I quite like Bugs Bomb, but that's maybe because I've become accustomed to it. <laughs> yes? Uh, this is a, former, a, a statement, but a former question. Um, with the Bucks bomb, there was an existing structure that he was asked to add on to. But with the Joseph Rosenfield, he was asked to create a new one, but, and I was here on campus when that was evolving, I wasn't before. But with that one, well, there was an attempt to reproduce existing spaces from North Campus and South Campus. And I guess my point is that the, the consumer plays some role with the architect that affects the final product. And so, uh, you know, I, it, it's not that just you simply give an architect a flat palette and say, create something. They have certain constraints. I, it's such a sort of... It, so it's... So that to compare the two, yeah, but he, his approach to each one of them had to be different because of the restrictions or the demands or the preferences or what have it to the person or the people who are guiding the initial discussion. That's this is a question slash comment um, <laughs> that is particularly about, I guess the desires of the patron and what the community is demanding from the architect has an impact on what is built. And I think, I think you're absolutely correct there, that what is being commissioned in the context of Buxbaum is very different than what is being commissioned in the context of the JRC. And he's responding to those college needs. Um, and doing so in the best way he can. Because part of, part of the 
particularly the JRC, was having a huge amount of square footage, almost like 200,000 square feet, of meeting spaces, of dining hall, of a large dining hall to encompass the entirety of campus. So really working around, and, and it goes back to sort of form follows function with Louis Sullivan, the architect is gonna to correspond to sort of what they're being asked of, which go, you see throughout history. So I, I think that's very true. I also think it's interesting because the JRC thinking about Buxbaum sort of incorporating a former building and expanding from it, GRC also represented the destruction of a significant building on campus. Um, um, the um, Darby Gym, which is a late Art Deco building, I want to say from like 1941 if I'm correct? 40, yeah, 41, 42, yeah. Um, and I always get sad about that because it, first of all, it had a unique wooden truss ceiling and it was probably the only major example of Art Deco on campus. And I am obsessed with Art Deco. I'm, in a new project on Art Deco, and I feel like there's there's some examples in town, or there's some buildings that have an Art Deco influence, like the Masonic Temple. Um, you could say it has an Art Deco influence, it also has a neoclassical influence, but that was just an architectural gem on campus that we lost. Um, so. Yes? Uh, it's interesting to me that the in trying to recreate functions from other parts of campus, the 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 JRC um, also recreated some of the problems that the uh, earlier buildings had. For instance, South Lounge was replaced by JRC 101. South Lounge was a great space, but there were problems when you when you had a meeting in there because uh, the person would stand up against a wall of glass. And all you ever saw was the the, the the lighting was poor, and all you ever saw was the, the sort of silhouette of the speaker. And they reproduced that perfectly. In the <laughs> so this this is um, what Ken is um, commenting on is that. Um, and replicating former spaces on campus, they've made the same mistakes <laughs> in those former spaces, with the example of uh, particularly 101, the main meeting space, having the same, I like to say it's like a fishbowl effect when I'm sitting and watching a lecture in JRC 101. Either the curtains are down and something's projecting, but there, there's like slits of light so I can't see the projection really well, or they're open and I'm distracted by the people walking by. What makes the JRC a little more annoying to me is that it's not the dark tinted glass, so it's like you could see very clearly what's outside, and it can be very distracting at times. Um, I also think there's an interesting, I call it, and this is me being very critical here, admittedly, I call it the Walmartization of campuses. There was this idea in the 2000s that, and you, you see it throughout colleges and universities in the US, an urban planning firm comes in, tells them, oh, you need to centralize everything, everything's inefficient, and then and a lot of colleges and universities build campus centers around this time by prominent architects, because it had to be the prominent statement building of your campus, it's part of the campus development. And what I've noticed coming back, so when I was a student, you'd have to go here to get your mail, you'd have to go here to get coffee, you'd have to go here. So people wondered and interacted in campus more. And now I like to see people get sucked into a center, and then they disperse from it. So it, it, it impacts the way you negotiate a space and understand and relate to, a, uh, and relate to others within a space. So to me, they're, they're, I could sometimes get nostalgic, and I think that's inevitably what happens with modern architecture. There's always this nostalgia for how things were different in the past before these new, bigger things came. Yeah, George. Well, comment just following Kent's of the opposite effect. Uh, when some of us in this room were students at Grinnell, the theater was in ARH, at the lower level where one or two were. Very small very confined stage, there's only one entrance to the stage from one side, really small and constricted. So what do they do? They build Robert's Theater as the antidote. Way too big stage. We don't do much at Robert's Theater now in theater uh, because the stage is too big, it's awkward, uh, the shape of the, of the space is wrong for projecting your voice and so on, but they went at absolutely the other direction. We're not going to have a small stage, we're going to have a big one. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, so scale, I think, is something that's very significant, particularly within a small town and a small campus. What's the scale to your building and how does it speak to your audience there, I think is an interesting question, or to the users of that space. Yes? 
One of the things you didn't mention about uh, the forum uh, interests me, and I wonder what you think about it, uh, the name. Uh, it wasn't a student center, it was the forum. And I wonder to what, I mean, people have talked about what Howard Bowen might have intended for this, but in your view, does it matter that it's called the forum, this building that is transparent in the way that Kent was talking about, as, as opposed to being a student center or a Rosenfield center? I want to say it's significant, but I just lost, oh, so this is a question of the name of the building and its significance. What does it mean to be called the forum rather than a center? Um, my answer is yes and no. <laughs> um, no, in the sense that the function of the building is still the function of the building, but the name did have a symbolic purpose, I feel, I, and it almost makes me think like the ancient fora, these spaces where people gather. So making that reference to me did have perhaps a symbolic significance within the forum. Um, but there is this idea with the center of everything sort of coming, of converging in one space. So there, there is, I feel like... But, but one of the ways that I think that this is interesting, at least what I heard Bowen thought was relevant to this, was the extent of the building being transparent, which you were talking about that same mm -hmm. impact about 101, but it also plays out the other SOM building, which you didn't talk about, uh, the really? library, where you have glass also on both sides, uh, the north and the south. So you have this kind of penetration in a way that certainly the, the Pelly buildings don't aspire to uh, that same sort of transparency or openness. That's a great point. Um, and so it was a comment about um, the certain notion of transparency that's evident in the materials of both um, the example of Berling Library and the example of the Forum versus that of Cesar Pelli where there's no longer a concern. And I think that's where we're getting into a very smart, critical reading about how architecture may reflect values in an interesting way. Um, so how the structure of the institution and its values might be reflected in the ideals. So I do, I do think that's a significant point, sort of, not only the, in both you have the notion of, of technology and the play of materiality, to represent sort of the goal of a modern institution for educating, um, a modern institution for producing knowledge and educating young people. But in, I do think that that analogy that you're creating between sort of that being able to see through and that sense of transparency, the fora was built partly, you know, there were administrative student affairs in there, but it, it was built as sort of this student center for student governance. Um, and that sense of governance that comes from that type of, of campus center or forum versus the new form is very different. So I do think there's a way you can attach the values to the form of the building. Yes? Uh, the one building you have mentioned was the John Crystal building. I heard that it was absolutely, it, it's very pretty, but when you want to have computers working, it was a bad story. And then I keep looking at the front with all the stained glass, and I never see anybody sitting around in, in that building. Maybe I just go at the wrong time, but I think it's a waste. <laughs> I'm, I'm very interested in the future of this building, too. Um, <laughs> because um, I used, when I was a student, I worked in the admissions office, and I used to work Saturday mornings at the front desk. I was the first face a lot of parents saw, which is kind of scary. <laughs> uh, but, and, and so at first, I was kind of shocked, because I remember admissions moving from mirrors into that building. I'm like, this is a brand new building. Why are we building a new admissions office? But when I saw the floor plan of the new admissions office that's currently in construction, it made so much sense to me. The kitchen is now behind the front desk, so you don't have to go down two levels to get like coffee and cookies when you need to like replenish um, the supplies for the, the visitors. Um, so it's, it was a building that I think had all the good intentions. Like it was open, it was glass, it was intended as sort of a marker so that when you came by, you could distinguish campus from town. You have entered the campus to see the, you know, the Crystal Center. Um, it also made a lot of local references. It used Iowa limestone, for example. Um, it, it's an aesthetically interesting building, but there were some failures to that building that didn't make it functional in the way that it should be. And, and there was also some ADA issues with that building, which is kind of funky for a building from 2002 to have issues with accessibility, especially in a place like Grinnell. Um, so part of me feels 
the necessity to preserve the building, A, because it's a very young building, so I think it's silly for the college to invest so much money in a building and then like not know what to do with it. But they're gonna have to think creatively because the way the sun shines into that building, it can be quite distracting. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, just to follow up to Karen's question, this whale room, I, I've been in JRC many times, but I've never seen that room. And is it, I mean, what's the value? Of this <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful, but so this is a question about the well room we're seeing here, and, um, and where is it, <laughs> and why? <laughs> well, it's you have to when you're entering to the dining hall, you have to go all the way through the di the main dining area, and it's kind of like this hidden specialized dining area where there's double doors too. So it's kind of. It's an interesting space because it's kind of, it's both very open and overtly there, but it's also like you have to like navigate through and go through these closed doorways to get in. So, and the idea, I guess, is at a spectacular scale to create sort of an intimate setting. I also get the sense of sort of um, this reference to its quad dining hall within it, because you could, if anyone's been in quad dining hall, which is one of the most beautiful spaces on campus, um, and you have these sort of, a lot of people say it's like um, entering into Harry Potter. You have these like beautiful ceilings. So I think it's trying to make a, like, a contemporary reference to that. I could be wrong, but I believe it's trying to do that within the space. So trying to create that sort of same sense of awe, but in an entirely contemporary way. Yes? When you go visit some college campuses, the architecture on campus seems to be the same in all the buildings. And some people I've heard criticized Grinnell for having a hodgepodge of various architectural designs. Any comment on that? So this is a question, some campuses you go and it seems like they have the same types of buildings, and then there's a critique of Grinnell that it's quite hodgepodge, and sort of what's my take on that. Um, I think it's a fair critique. Um, I mean, each campus is different. Um, where I was formerly at Duke University, that was a campus that was built entirely in the 1920s all at once. And one was done in sort of the Gothic style to look like Princeton University, and the other was done in the Georgian style, it almost looks like University of Virginia. Um, so it's kind of mimicking, and it's a cohesive style throughout. So it's interesting to come from a place where the style is really cohesive in a deliberate manner, to be in a place where it is quite hodgepodge. And I think part of the reason Brunel's hodgepodge too is that where we have destroyed some of our older buildings, and when we build new buildings, there's not... I do think SOM built to a scale that was considerate of the buildings that were already there, to some extent. But you have the destruction of, of buildings to build both, um, both of the buildings that were SOM buildings, actually. Um, both um, the original arts building and um, the Berlin Library took over where Blair and Chicago Hall were. Um, I, but I do think it's, it's a fair critique. It's interesting because sometimes people say Grinnell's not a beautiful campus, and I just agree with that. I do think it's a beautiful campus. Um, and I think this town has beautiful architecture. It makes teaching architectural history more interesting for me because there's a hodgepodge of buildings that I can refer to when I'm talking about different styles. So for me, it's more effective at a pedagogical level. Um, but I do think there is part of me that wishes that Grinnell saved more of its past. And I even think about the renovations of ARH, I was mentioning to someone during the break that I miss sitting in the old wooden chairs of ARH. When I was a student, they got rid of those wooden chairs and put like these swivel chairs. And, and this is perhaps the conservative, like, Ruskin side of me, where I'm like the awe of the chairs, sitting in the same chairs as the students of the 1920s, that were completely falling apart, and I could see why they changed it. Um, but there is sort of, in a small residential college, I do feel it's important to have like this history and this cohesion that I don't think fully exists at Grinnell. It'll be interesting when the new building finishes, um, the HSSC, to see how that impacts the campus. Yes. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a pleasure. <laughs>
uh, Professor Eric McIntyre will begin his four-week um, course on music, of course, more than meets the ear. So come back, and if you would like to, if you haven't registered yet and you would like to do that before you leave, see one of us at the table out front. We'll take your name to make sure that you get a space. Jack. And they like to see this again on YouTube This class will be on YouTube tomorrow, so you can tune in and see it again. So remember now to um, turn on your cell phones and turn off your T-coils, and we hope to see you next week. Thanks for coming.